Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of Geiko and Maiko. I'm Paul Bresson. And I'm Jason Neeling, and today our topic is Geisha, aka Geiko, aka Geigi. And Maiko fits in there too. We'll we'll talk about them. Yeah. Just to let you all know at the start, geisha are Japanese women who entertain through performing traditional dance, singing, art, music. Hospitality is a big part of what they do. They're there to entertain you and not just like put on a show, but just be part of the experience and like make sure you're having fun. Yeah, they're like a stage performer, but they're pouring you drinks too. Right. Um, they're known for wearing kimono and their white makeup. Yeah, it's a pretty distinctive style. I think most people have an image in their head of what a geisha looks like. Yeah. You got the white face, you got red lips, pretty ornate hairdo. It's a, it's a specific look. Yeah. And just to break down all the words we've thrown at you so far. Mm-hmm. So geisha. The gay part of that, that means art. Yes. So geisha translates to artist or performing artist. Geiko is what geisha in the western part of Japan, which includes Kyoto, mm-hmm. are called. Right. And geiko translates to woman of art. Yep. The ko part is the woman. Another thing that you'll hear in parts of Japan, such as niigata, is geigi. And, you know, all these basically mean the same thing, an artist, a performer. Yeah, someone who does art. Mm-hmm. At the very beginning here, I just want to point out that geisha has a very long history in Japan, and different things happened in different parts of the country. Like, there, there hasn't been a ton of standardization, even today. Different areas do things slightly differently. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about doesn't apply everywhere yeah it's like some people were doing this at some time or are doing it now Mm -hmm. yeah even these days the geiko and the geisha from different parts of the country are going to do things slightly different different styles and some different ways of doing things yep i also mentioned maiko which translates to woman of dance Mm -hmm. and they are geisha in training yeah apprentice geishas yes yeah also a common misconception apparently Paul, did you ever feel like you had heard that geisha are involved in the sex industry? Yeah, when I was younger, that was my first impression of them, I think. Okay. Apparently, that's a pretty common misconception in uh, the Western world. And we'll see when we talk about the history. The lines have been blurred in different time periods between geisha and the sex industry. But these days, geisha are purely performers. Yeah. Part of the, I think, how it got into the West that they're involved with sex industry or prostitution is because when we were occupying Japan in the 40s and 50s, there were prostitutes over there that called themselves geisha girls. Yeah, but they weren't actually They weren't geisha, geisha, but the name kind of came back with the sailors and servicemen. Yeah. Well, we'll get into that more in the history section, but uh, the last thing I wanted to say at the very beginning here is that... I was struck during this research with just how separate geisha are from the normal world. It's said that they live in the flower and willow world, or the karyukai. Yeah. And, I mean, when you start to learn about what their lives are like, it really feels like that. Like, they live in these really traditional areas of the cities, and they're not allowed to even use cell phones out in public. Like, their lives are very structured, and they're symbols of the ultimate beauty and perfection. So we'll we'll learn a lot more about I what that really means. I think it's really but. striking and funny that we just did an episode on sumo, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like the traditional manliness. Like yeah. they're hanging on to the tradition, and they're fighters, and they do things a certain way. And then geisha, in a way, is like the traditional femininity, the traditional entertainment. Well, they're both entertainment, sumo and geisha, Mm -hmm. just in slightly different ways. Yeah, definitely. I I noticed a lot of parallels between those, especially in like the intensity of the training. Yeah, they're both living old style lives in modern day Japan. Yeah, totally. It's a good intro, I think. Well done, Paul. Thanks. Let's dive into some history. Yeah, let's do that. Who were the first geisha? Well... The first people to call themselves geisha. You know, I actually wanted to go even further back than that. Is that okay? All right. I just wanted to shock everyone right away. 
Yeah, I get where you're going, but uh, you know, I like to go way back to the very right. beginning of this stuff. All right, Jason, let's go way back to the beginning. What's okay, the earliest thing you could find relating to Geisha? <laughs> well, the history of female performers in Japan dates back to over a millennium. And Japan has had some tumultuous periods way back, as a lot oh, of yeah. the world has, you know? You're right. And uh, in hard times, people do what they have to to survive. So for women, a lot of times that meant finding a way to perform and entertain people for money. And for some of them, that meant prostitution. And there was a kind of a lot of overlap there. Like, you, you do what you have to. Yeah. So the modern geisha didn't show up until the 18th century, but there's some remnants in the past that were the building blocks for what would eventually become geisha. When times got tough, I heard a lot of peasant women were forced into prostitution, mm -hmm. but times got tough sometimes for the samurai class or the upper class too, when there were wars and the women from the upper classes would entertain, they would sing and dance yeah, and they do what they needed to do to make an income so their families could survive. Yeah, because they would have been trained in that. Like yeah, they're... reading poetry, all sorts of artistic stuff. They would get paid to entertain with it. Mm -hmm. So there's a long history of that type of thing going way back. Yeah, and so the white makeup, you know, that's a pretty striking feature of geisha. And that was actually worn in the 12th century by these female dancers known as shirabyoshi who performed for nobility and at celebrations. So here's where we're going to, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sex industry and its place in Japanese culture, because prostitution has been happening all over the world for probably most of human history. Let's get the oldest thing. profession, as the joke goes. Yeah. But in Japan, they've had a culture that had a slightly different relationship with that kind of work. So in, in Japanese history, men were not expected to be faithful to their wives. Shinto, even the national religion of Japan, has no problem with being free about sex, having yeah. sex with other people. And they also had imported some Confucian ideas from China, where it was like, you have certain responsibilities to your wife and your family, but being sexually faithful wasn't actually one of them. Yeah, yeah. So wives were meant to be mothers and home managers. That was their main job. And love wasn't necessarily involved all that much. Yeah. Um, so men... They still want the sex and romance kind of stuff. So instead of getting it from their wives, they would go to courtesans, high-class prostitutes, basically. And you know, I thought this was really interesting because if you look at sex industry in Japan these days, you'll see not only the commoditizing of sexual gratification, but also romance. They've commoditized romance in Japan and intimacy. You know, there are places you can go where nothing overtly sexual happens. But there's just this intimacy. And it's a super blurred line. Mm -hmm. You hear about these things like where you can go somewhere and puts your head on a woman's lap and she cleans out your ears. Right. And you're paying for this. And like, it's not sex, but it's also like really intimate. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can go pay to lay down with a woman and talk to her. You just talk. But it's pretty intimate, like when you're laying down and just staring into somebody's eyes, you know? Yeah. Like it's, it's romantic. And it's, I feel like in the U.S., people think that's really weird. But our America has a big history of uh, kind of sexual repression in a lot of ways. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, I don't know, you just don't see the same commoditization of romance right. in the U.S. I mean, it makes sense in a certain way. Someone's missing something in their life. Someone else can provide it. Transaction occurs. Mm-hmm. It's all touchy subjects based on every individual person's morals. Yeah. There's even a modern day culture of hostess clubs in Japan. There might be some relationship dating back to the way geishas entertain people versus going to a modern hostess club where you basically pay to spend time with women pouring you drinks and mm -hmm. laughing at your jokes and whatnot. Yeah, I'm sure it ties in somehow. So uh, we're going to talk about the shogunate again. Almost every episode, the shogunate comes up. <laughs> yep. So in 1617, not long after the shogunate came to power, the Tokugawa in Japan, shogunate. Right. They designated these pleasure quarters. So before, you know, prostitution was legal everywhere in Japan, but the Tokugawa shogunate made it so that prostitution was only legal in these designated pleasure quarters. And uh, 
women called yujo, which translates to play women, uh, were classified and licensed. So this was a much more structured sex industry than had ever been seen before in yeah. Japan. But gathering all of that into condensed specific zones also like built up those zones to becoming entertainment districts. It right. wasn't just sex anymore. You could go there for music, entertainment, drinks. It was just a fun place to go. Exactly. So this is where we see the predecessor of the geisha, the Taiyu, which was kind of an actress slash prostitute. Like she was an entertainer, but you could also sleep with her. And uh, they performed erotic dances and skits. And the art that they pioneered was known as kabuku, wild and outrageous is what that translates to. <laughs> and that was the beginning of kabuki theater, which is yeah, a that, big thing today. That even. blew my mind that that's what kabuki traces back to. I yeah. did not know that. Yeah, me either. So like you said, the pleasure quarters became general entertainment centers. You could do a lot of stuff there, not just pay for sex. So you had these courtesans known as oidan. You read much about them? Yeah. They're really expensive. <laughs> like these are high class courtesans. Not just anybody could come in and hire them. And they, yeah. in addition to offering sex, they offered dancing, singing. They would play music. Some of them were really good at calligraphy and poetry. Yeah, they're really talented people. Mm -hmm. So eventually people started to specialize. So instead of being jacks of all trades and doing everything, you'd have people that would focus on the entertainment. You'd have people that were focusing on the sex work. And uh, eventually geisha emerged as entertainers in the 1730s. And this is the big fact that, that you were getting at earlier, Paul. Do you, do you want to do it? Yeah. Uh, the first geisha were men. Yeah. And they were entertaining customers that were waiting to see the popular courtesans. Yep. So where, where did the women geisha come from? Well, I'll tell you. So in the late 1600s, there were these girls known as odoriko. And odori means dance. And they ko, were dancing girls. Yep, we talk about ko means girl, so you got these dancing girls. And this is another thing that might seem uh, a little weird, because they were trained teenage dancers, like they had to be teenagers. It was different times. It was different, definitely. And they were hired by samurai to perform in their homes. So... <laughs> they were advertised as like pure and chaste. Yeah, yeah. They I were, don't know, who knows what went down. Yeah. Well, by the early 1700s, apparently a lot of them had turned to prostitution, but originally they were, you know, dancers. Well, yeah. Once they weren't teenagers anymore, they couldn't go around building themselves as Odorico. So mm -hmm. they had to find something else to do or call themselves by a different name. And eventually some of them started calling themselves geisha. Yep. Um, you know, I just wanted to make one comment about those samurai. They were feudal landlords. Right. Well, before this era, they were running around fighting. But by the 1600s, Japan was peaceful at that time. There wasn't a lot of fighting. So at that point, samurai were basically uh, bureaucrats. Yeah. You know? Japan had been united peacefully for quite a while at that point. Just didn't need that huge army anymore. Right. And a lot of these people probably didn't even know a ton about sword play. Or even if they were trained in it, they didn't have a lot of first-hand they were just, experience. They were just the upper class. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so you said the Odoriko, some of them as started, they aged out. Yeah, they, some of them started calling themselves geisha. Yeah. And performing alongside the men doing mm -hmm. similar things. Yeah, and before long, they uh, started to get more popular than the men. And by the 1780s, they dominated that role. Yeah, I heard by 1800, being a geisha was basically considered to be a female occupation. Mm -hmm. Even though as few male geisha still uh, exist today, apparently. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So geisha were working alongside these courtesans, but they didn't want them competing. So these geisha were forbidden from having like relationships with yeah with clients and part of this was because the courtesans were so popular that they actually had clout and power in japanese society mm -hmm. so they were able to get these rules passed to stop geisha from competing with them mm -hmm. but over time 
the courtesans were more flamboyant or however you want to say it in the way they went about it. And the geisha were more classical and subtle. And the geisha just kind of flipped into style. Mm -hmm. Well, the geisha were also less expensive. Like we said, these courtesans were real expensive. So eventually the geisha kind of started to grow in popularity uh, relative to the courtesans. And they were also more socially accessible. So like they're there to hang out with you and entertain you, you know? Yeah. And people started gravitating towards that. So that was the 1800s. And then their popularity just kept growing in the Meiji era. I hear by the 1830s, they're already kind of considered leaders in fashion and style where Mm. other women would look to like, what are the geisha doing? And import those styles into like Japanese society. Yeah, pretty cool. So in the Meiji era, which was between 1868 to 1912, they'd found their place in society for sure. And they were entertainers for dinner events for large companies and government officials, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's part of where, even to this day, they've got a strong tradition of what you say around a geisha will never be repeated. Yeah. Because they often entertain for important business meetings or important government functions. So the things that they heard discussed can be really important. Mm -hmm. And there's a long history of they will not spill the beans. Right. They just want to make sure you're having the best time possible, which means you sh- you need to be able to f- say whatever you want, do whatever you want, and... It's between the- you and her, right. and no one else is ever going to be involved in it. Right. So I believe the peak of geisha culture was around the 1920s. Does that sound about right? Yeah. There were, there were about 80,000 geisha in Japan. Did you find a good number for how many there are today? I saw around 1,000, I think. Yeah, I saw like one to 2,000. Yeah. So like that's sumo. a significant difference. <laughs> yep, dropping in popularity. So the next thing I've got is World War II. Yeah. Um, by 1944, the tail end of the war, all the geisha districts got closed, and they were sent off to go work in factories or contribute to the war effort, however way Mm -hmm. that was deemed. Yeah, but even right before the war, popularity was declining because of the effects of westernization. Like all those traditional Japanese things were already starting to wane. Just Mm -hmm. sad, I think. But uh, yeah, so the war. The war made things pretty difficult. A lot of geisha, like you said, worked in factories. And after the war, a lot of these geisha districts didn't reopen. Yeah, in 1945, it became okay for them to open back up, or some of them. Mm-hmm. And some geisha came back, but a lot didn't. Right. They found jobs or other lives to live. Mm-hmm. But some came back, and the art continued, and the tradition continued. And there was, in the early post-war years, kind of this battle between, are we going to hold to our traditions or are we going to westernize a little bit and modernize in how we entertain people? Yeah. And within the geisha community, the tradition won out. So they continued to do things the way they had in mm-hmm. the past, Yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, definitely. But just after the war, there was also another thing that the geishas had to deal with, which you mentioned at the beginning, is that so the U.S. was occupying Japan at the time, and... These women dressed up as geisha, like they weren't actually trained as geisha. They didn't have all the skills, but they would dress up and sell themselves to American soldiers calling themselves geisha girls. Yeah. So that kind of led to that misconception, perhaps. That, yeah, uh, a got lot a stereotype of, going. Yeah. Yeah, the soldiers called them geisha girls. <laughs> of course. Was, yeah. Um, so today, like I said, there are only around 1,000 geisha, 2,000, somewhere around there. And most of them are in Kyoto at uh, traditional tea houses. They perform at luxurious traditional restaurants known as ryote. Yeah. The 1960s economic boom, from what I saw, seemed to kind of help bring them back to life a little bit. Hmm. Because so many businesses were doing so well. You know, they started having more business meetings with geisha entertaining, and it got the industry going back up a little bit. Yeah. Which is good. So in this history part, I did want to mention something that people might have heard of too, because I guess, you know, the movie Memoirs of a Geisha, 
Yeah. Which was based on a book, right? Yeah. Which was not written by a Japanese person. No, it was not. <laughs> and is not necessarily it's a, not, a good not representation. It was not by a Japanese person. It was... So don't don't take that movie as historically accurate. Yeah. Um, but there is apparently something that happened in that movie. I saw it a long time ago. I don't really remember. But there's a, a scene where a geisha had her virginity sold, basically. Yeah. That does uh, not happen anymore. Well, even back then, there's evidence that it happened in certain places, but it wasn't widespread, apparently. Like, even even back then, there were places that forbid that kind of thing. Right, because even going back hundreds of years, there were geisha that didn't have sex for money. They mm-hmm. didn't do any of that. So it's, it was here and there, it did happen. Mm-hmm. But it was never like, a, this happens to everybody type of thing. Right. And it definitely hasn't happened in a long time. Yep. All right, so shall we move on to how does one become a geisha? Yeah, what does it take to become a geisha? It takes a lot, Yeah, apparently. Jeez. Rigorous training for years yeah. sometimes. Yeah, so historically in the past, geisha could start training as early as age three, I saw. Yeah, but part of that was because daughters of geisha were trained to become geisha. Yeah. So obviously they would start young. Yeah. These days, the earliest you can even start training to become a geisha is after middle school. So between like 14 and 17. And that's only in Kyoto too. Tokyo doesn't allow that. In Japan, you have to go to school at least through middle school. Mm -hmm. So most of the girls are at least 15 by the time they're done with middle school, which is the earliest you could possibly go to train to become a geisha. Right. Tokyo has a law though that they need to be 18. Got to finish high school, I guess. Yeah, and I've heard that quite a lot of them do finish high school. Sometimes even do some college before they... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no geisha. upper age limit, I don't Yeah, think, you can become ge- a geisha as a full-grown woman. Mm-hmm. Yep, just got to be properly trained. Yep. So how do you get trained? You need to get an apprenticeship. Yeah, so you're going to apply to a place called an okia. You know, if you listen to the last episode about sumo, they had those heia where they trained sumo wrestlers and they trained and lived there. It's the same kind of deal with the geisha in the okia. So there are parts of the city called hanamachi, which means like a flower street. And a lot of times there are a bunch of these okia. Like that's where all the geisha are, you know. That's part of that uh, flower and willow world, right? Yep. So you're going to apply to an okia and you're going to meet the okasan. So okasan in Japanese translates to mother. And each of these okia has a mother who basically a surrogate mother for all of the trainees. Yeah, she's the proprietress. Yeah. And I want to mention here, this is an interesting thing, I think. Basically, the entire geisha world is run by women. Men, they're there once in a while as hairdressers or like if they need a really strong guy to tie a kimono really tight. They'll be around for that. But the people actually running the show are always women. Yeah. It's women training women. It's all women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can go straight through training and become a geisha. But if you're uh, younger than like 20, you might train to become a maiko, which is an apprentice geisha. So even before you become the apprentice, you need training to get to that point. And that training just to become a maiko can potentially take years. It seems like it depends a lot on what the Okasan thinks of your progress, and it probably depends on the Okia as well. So once the Okasan decides that you're ready, what is the next step? So you start as a Minarai, which literally translates to learn by watching. Mm -hmm. So you would go to certain banquets or events, and you would sit there and just watch the other Maiko and Geisha interact with the customers mm-hmm. you sit there and watch and learn mm-hmm. and it usually only lasts in this stage for about a month and after a month you become a maiko i mean even once you're a maiko you're still gonna get training like the training doesn't stop right and it's expensive right it can be thousands of dollars per month they supply them with food and board and their kimono and their obi and the other tools they need but you rack up a debt for this right? that They're you gonna... have to pay off once you start working. Yeah. And only once you've paid it off can you move out on your own. Right. 
So let's talk a little bit about what the training is like, because it's serious. Did you see like what these training sessions kind of look like? Yeah, I mean, generally the trainers seem to be pretty harsh because they want everything to be perfect. So they really ride these girls pretty hard. Like, you're not doing it right. Correct this. Get this right. In this very, very specific training, every little movement that you make is scrutinized. Yeah. So they're training you in traditional dance, traditional instruments. You're going to learn to play the shamisen, which is a, a stringed instrument. There are three strings. It looks sort of like a guitar, but not really. They train you in social skill, how to interact with people, how to entertain people. Yeah, etiquette. Geisha are known for being like masters of etiquette. Nobody's better at etiquette than a geisha. And they'll be trained in how to open a door. Like they need to get down on their knees, open the door, and then stand up from their knees in a certain way. And if they do it wrong, they're going to do it again right. and again and again. Everything about how they carry themselves and how they do everything, there's a certain way you're supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. And they will correct you until you get it right. Yep. There's a certain way you're supposed to hold the tray when you bring out the drinks. You're going to learn a lot of instruments. They got the shime daiko, which is like a little drum, traditional Japanese drum. You got uh, the koto, which is another stringed instrument. You got the fue, which is a flute. And they're going to learn to sing. I mean, it's just nonstop training, hours and hours every single day. Yeah, and they have a hierarchical relationship like a lot of things in Japan. They have what's called a Onesan and Emoto-san relationship, which is like big sister, little sister. Mm -hmm. So before you become an official Maiko, the Okasan, the mother, the proprietress of this place, is going to choose a name for you. You don't get to keep your name. You get a Maiko name. And uh, when the Okasan decides that you are ready, that is when you are paired with the Onesan, and you're going to be debuted as a Maiko through a, a ceremony called the Mise Dashi. And it's a big deal. You'll be in the newspaper, especially these days with such few geisha and maiko. It's going to be in the news, and there are going to be reporters coming to take pictures of you as you walk out of your okia, and you're going to walk around and visit all the local tea houses and introduce yourself as a maiko. That's cool. Mm -hmm. There's also a ceremony when you go from becoming a maiko to a full-fledged geisha as well. Right. You, you can be a Maiko until you're age 20, and then you would become a full-fledged geisha. If you start training over 20, that's when you're probably going to go straight to a geisha. Yeah. You usually still have to train for like a year or whatever, but they're yeah. not going to call you a Maiko. Right. You're right. too old. Like that's specifically for young girls. Mm -hmm. And when you become a geisha, there's, there's a ceremony, right? Yep. Would you say what it's called? No. It's called the eriage translates to changing of the collar because Maiko, well, we'll talk about their appearance more in a bit, but the Maiko have a red collar and the Geisha wear a white collar. So changing of the collar. So what happens once you become a full-fledged Geisha? You have to start developing a client base. Mm -hmm. You got all your skills and all these forms of entertainment and it's expensive. Like people that hire you are going to be paying a lot for that privilege. So what I saw is five hundred to a thousand dollars per geisha per night, and that's without food even. Like if you're hiring geisha, you're probably going to be eating and drinking. And the types of places where you can have a geisha perform are not cheap. The food is going to be one to three hundred dollars per person, in addition to the price of the geisha. You know, most people aren't going to be able to spend that much money on just a night out. So they're going to be performing for important people politicians, perhaps, big corporate meetings, that kind of thing. I also thought it was interesting that traditionally they would bill you based on something they called senkodai, which is an incense stick fee. Oh, so yeah. So basically they would light an incense and your time would be until the incense finished burning. That's one unit of time that you would pay for. Yeah, yeah, that's um, interesting. Today they tend to do ohana, or hanadai, which is a flower fee, as they call it. Mm. And it's per hour. Now they just time it with the clock. Yeah. And as a geisha, traditionally, you couldn't get married. These days, it depends on where you are in Japan. I know in Kanazawa, where I saw some geisha, they are allowed to get married. 
but you wouldn't tell the clients and the clients wouldn't ask because a big part of being a geisha is that you are shrouded in mystery. Yeah. It's almost like you have a mask on. You're not the person you are in your normal life or Mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said that these geisha are indebted to their okia because of all the money that went into their training and, you know, living there. So all of the pay that they do bring in is going to go to repaying that debt. And historically, a lot of women would decide to become geisha because that was like the only way they could gain independence, really. Most women were expected to marry and be homemakers and, and mothers. So the only way to really be a single woman with money that could go do what you want is to be a geisha and earn your freedom. Yeah. I mean, even today... I hear some people say that geisha are some of the most free women in Japan Hmm. because they make their own living. They handle all their own business. It's all run by women. Mm -hmm. So geisha are widely known for their unique appearance. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's do that. So let's start with their makeup. Geisha are definitely known for the white makeup worn covering the whole face. Mm -hmm. It's a thick white base and they tend to cover their face, their neck, their chest, but they leave like two or three uncovered lines kind of in a V or a W Mm -hmm. on their neck because that's a traditionally erotic place of the body in Japan. Yeah. The collars of their kimono are also kind of hanging back a bit to reveal their neck more. Yeah. That's supposed to be sexy. Mm -hmm. And that white makeup uh, it used to be made from lead and yeah. t- until they figured out that's that really was bad people. for you. Yeah, now I think it's made with rice powder. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to stick to their face because they start with a layer of like oil or wax to get it to, to stick. Yeah, they also leave uh, it bare right around the hairline to give the illusion that they're wearing a mask. Yeah, we should make a distinction between Maiko and Geisha because they do things a little bit differently. The Maiko, you're commonly going to see that line of uncovered skin by their hairline, but that's because Maiko use their natural hair. They're going to go get their hair done every week, and they're going to sleep with their head propped up so that it doesn't mess up their hair. Sounds very uncomfortable. Yeah. They can even develop a bald spot because their hair is pulled so tight into this fancy hairdo. But once they become geisha, most geisha will wear wigs. And that's going to come down and cover up their natural hairline. So you'll see the white makeup go right up to that hairline for full-fledged geisha. Yeah. Um, They're also known for the red lipstick Mm -hmm. and red and black accents around the eyes and eyebrows. Mm -hmm. I think, again, Maiko will have more red blush and around the eyes and eyebrows to show kind of a a cuter, more youthful look. Yeah, the Maiko will always be a little more flashy in what they wear. Yeah, and also with the lipstick. So in the first year of being a Maiko, they can only paint the bottom lip. And then uh, even once they get through a year, when they start painting both lips, it's still going to be thinner than a geisha. The makeup does change a little bit, for Mm -hmm. sure. And there's different levels of being a Maiko, and that will involve different makeup, a different dress and stuff sometimes. Mm Mm-hmm. But like you said, Maiko are generally much more flashy. Their kimonos are going to be a lot more colorful and intricate. Their obi is going to be big and like hanging down. Yep. Big flashy obi, which is the belt or sash that they wear around their waist to tie up the kimonos. Mm -hmm. And their Um, hair too. You're going to notice with Maiko, there's just all sorts of stuff sticking out of their hair. They got these things dangling down, strings of flowers and that kind of thing. Yeah, and the geisha might have some hairpins or a comb, but it'll be much more subdued and less colorful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, geisha are more, yeah, like you said, subdued is a good word. I mean, just more mature. Like they don't, they don't need to be flashy to get attention. They are, you know, they're powerful and graceful, and that's their image. Yeah, and you mentioned the kimonos, and those tend to change with the season. So they wear different kimonos, different times of year, and those kimonos. I heard can take two to three years to complete because of all the coloring and stitch work that goes into them. Yeah. And it makes them super expensive. The The whole outfit that Maiko and Geisha are dressed up in can be tens of thousands of dollars of stuff that they're wearing. Yep. It's crazy. 
The other big thing is their footwear. Mm -hmm. Geisha tend to wear geta, which are like raised wooden sandals. And Maiko wear what's called okobo, which are like platform sandals. But the front underneath the toes, it like angles inward. Yeah. It's hard to describe without looking up. Yeah. It's a very unique raised platform sandal. But I heard during poor weather, they both wear uh, Zori, which are like flat wooden sandals. Probably makes it easier to walk without like slipping in the snow or whatever. Yeah. You have anything else about the appearance? I think we covered the basics. Another thing though, is that if you are walking around Kyoto or Kanazawa or one of, one of these traditional type cities and you see people taking pictures with some geisha, take a close look at those geisha because you might find a bunch of inconsistencies and uh, a lot of times it's because they're not real geisha. Tourists can just go and get dressed up like a geisha, but most of the time when they're dressed up, there are going to be things that don't quite line up. Like they're wearing a wig, but they have a red collar, which is like a Maiko. So you got all these geisha elements, but also Maiko elements. Also, just the fact that they're sitting there taking a bunch of pictures with tourists, that's not something you'll see a lot with actual geisha and Maiko because... I mean, tourists really want those pictures and real geisha and maiko are assaulted (laughs) by tourists. So they'll take back streets and try to avoid being seen even. Yeah. I think most of the people that pay to dress up like that, they actually dress up like maiko because it's a little more flashier. You get the brighter colors. Mm -hmm. So people like doing that. Yeah. And also if you search for pictures of geisha online, which we found out, they're almost all maiko. Yeah, I don't because know why Maiko that is. are a little more seen, I think. Spend a little more, more time in public, fully dressed up, mm-hmm. and they've got the flashier colors and the youthful looks. Yeah. So a lot of pictures you've probably seen of geisha might actually be Maiko. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to really look closely to distinguish them. So let's talk a little bit about what the experience would be like being entertained by a geisha. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier a lot of the instruments, you know, the shamisen being a main one. Mm-hmm. They like to do dancing, mm-hmm. and there's always music with it, with all those instruments. Mm-hmm. The dancing is really like disciplined, subtle, stylized dancing that's really controlled. Yeah. And I thought it was really cool that every dance tells a story. Yeah, definitely. So they're going to have like a fan, and that fan can turn into anything. If they open it slightly, they turn it upside down and it's a bottle of sake and they can mime that they're like pouring some sake with that. Or they'll open it all the way and wave it in a specific way and that's like the rolling water of a river. That fan is like their one prop and it can turn into anything. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I've heard like the long sleeves of the kimono can be used to symbolize tears and crying. Mm -hmm. You have to be really knowledgeable about the dance to understand all the little subtleties of the story they're trying to tell. Yeah. But it's really deep what they're doing. And that's part of why they drill it so hard into them. You have to make this dance perfect to like tell this story the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Every little movement is important. Also, many geisha are still known for poetry or painting or even composing music Mm. because they're artists. Yep. And there's games they play. Yeah. So there was one game that I saw that was a rhythm game where there was a little block of wood on a table and you would tap it with the rhythm taking off turns between you and the geisha. And if one of you picked up the piece of wood, the other one would have to knock instead of tapping. Yep. You know, make a fist and tap your fist instead of a flat hand. Yeah. And then you could either put back the wood or you could keep the wood in your hand so Mm -hmm. they have to knock again. Yeah. The first one to make a mistake has to drink. Yeah, it, it's a, it looks like a fun game. I've actually seen this in person when I attended a geisha performance in Kanazawa. Every time I've seen it then, and you know what I found in my research was that it was usually a little upside down bowl kind of thing that they're grabbing. Yeah, it could probably be anything. Yeah. When yeah, I, I mean, first saw this, I thought, you know, that'd be fun, but it's probably just fun because you got all these cute girls laughing every time someone screws up and then you're drinking But I mean, drinking games in general aren't much fun if you only got two people. You know, it takes a crowd to have a lot of of fun with a drinking game. And part of the fun thing about that game, it gets harder. You start out going slow, 
and then it slowly speeds up and it's you know it's a game of skill since they're playing the music they can kind of do it however they yeah. want I mean, the geisha, that's one of their things, so they're right. good at it. You got to compete I, against them. I bet they purposely lose from time to time, but you <laughs> probably lose more than they do. I wonder. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, if they play it enough, they could just I suppose, dominate. Yeah. <laughs> you think about it like a drinking game, you're totally right. That'd be fun if there's like a bunch of people around and everyone's having a good time and yeah. laughing every time someone screws up yeah. and drinking. Well, next time we have some people over, we should play that game. That'd okay, okay. We'll see how fun it is. Yeah. I'm not quite a geisha, but I'll do my best. <laughs> we can find some white makeup for you and <laughs> do your hair in a pretty way. So you actually saw a geisha performance, didn't you? I did. What was um, that like? Well, so, you know, I was I was really glad to be able to do this because, like we said, geisha performances are generally super expensive and most foreigners just don't get a chance to do that. But I went to a show in Kanazawa called Geisha Evenings in Kanazawa I think this is a special event that they put on just at a certain time of the year. Like there aren't that many of the performances and uh, it's specifically for tourists. So it took place at Kaikaro, a traditional tea house in the Higashi Chaya district, Ahanamachi. Remember the flower streets uh, in Kanazawa? And oh, the place, the area looks really cool. These Hanamachi are on these stone paved streets very old style wooden buildings going down. There are no cars to drive through there. It's very traditional looking. So even just walking up to the place, you're like, okay, I'm in different type of place. So in this show, Lady Baba was the name of the Okasan. And she she was so awesome, man. She learned English so that she could do these shows and like explain geisha culture to tourists. That's awesome. And she's just awesome. She's hilarious. And if you go look at the website for this, just Google like geisha evenings in Kanazawa. You'll find a picture of her and a couple geisha. One of those geisha on the website is one of the ones that I saw perform actually. Nice. But she told us a lot about geisha culture. She brought out these geisha to perform for us. They played that game, which is called Kompira Fune Fune, the one with the, the drinking game we were the talking about. The rhythm game, yeah. Yep. And I wanted to share some of the things that she told us. And... I didn't see these verified in, in my research, so I don't know if this is a thing specific to this tea house or how general it is about these types of places in the rest of Japan, but even for Japanese people, you can't just show up to a tea house and request a geisha. You need to be introduced. So one of the clients that has already been there needs to bring you in and uh, vouch for you, basically. Like, they're, they're responsible if you mess up or do something bad. And another interesting thing is that money does not change hands at the tea house, ever. Like, Yeah, I think that has partly to do with the way that you have to build a relationship to even get to see a geisha. Mm -hmm. So they'll just send you a bill. But also, it works into the idea that you're there for fun. They don't want you worrying about, oh, how much am I paying for this? I need to pull up my wallet at the end of the night. No, you go, you have fun, and you leave. And they send you that bill, this place, I don't know if every place does it this way, but they said that they send out the bill only once a year. There's oh, wow. a certain day of the year <laughs> that you get a bill in the mail for all your visits to the tea house. That's interesting. And get this, if you can't pay, if you don't have enough money or whatever, or you just refuse to pay... The person that introduced you, that brought you in for the first time, they're responsible for your bill. Yeah. I mean, that's the only reason they take credit because they know someone's going to pay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So yeah, it was a great experience. I highly recommend it. There aren't a ton of opportunities for you to have such a up close and personal experience with a geisha. So I would, I would recommend that or, you know, Google around. Other cities might have similar little things. Yeah, I found a list of like 15 or 20 things where you could like attend a banquet that a geisha would be performing at or something. Mm -hmm. There's a few things here or there, but it's not like all over the place, easy to get into. Yeah, but a lot of those events are still going to be, like you said, big banquets. Like there'll be a couple geisha and a bunch of people there. But this one that I went to, it was pretty small room, pretty small crowd, pretty intimate experience. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. You got anything else about Geisha? I don't think so. I think that's it. Well, all right. So I guess that's the end of the episode. If 
you want to find us online, you can check out our website at sightseeingjapanpodcast.com. If you want to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you found the podcast, that would be super awesome of you. Uh, And Paul, what are we talking about next week? Next week, we are talking about one of my favorites, Japanese gardens. They're so beautiful. They're so aesthetically pleasing. I'm really excited. Yeah, that should be fun. There's there's a lot that goes into them that you might not uh, expect. So look forward to that. And I wanted to end this episode with just a little recording of a real live geisha performance. So we kept talking about the shamisen. You're going to hear the shamisen, uh, the stringed instrument, and you'll hear a geisha singing. So enjoy that, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.